Hello, boys and girls. I'm Pearl of Wisdom, and you're listening to my NHL Pearls of Wisdom. Um, today, we're going to be looking at the Seattle Kraken and which direction that they will be going to build their team through the expansion draft and forward. Now, we are projecting which direction that they're going based on indicators of what they've done so far. Um, before I go on, though, if you could hit the subscribe and the bell, it really helps the channel. Of course, I'll send you a My NHL Pearls of Wisdom necklace perlocopter to your door by Hernandez or Melissa. In fact, Hernandez, load up the perlocopter with as many Pearls of Wisdom necklaces as you can get. So, because we're about to get flooded with subscribers right now, aren't we? Yes. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Um, so, the first indicator we have into which direction Seattle may likely go was to me the hiring of Ron Francis as a general manager. Um, Ron Francis in Carolina, uh, when he was in Carolina, he basically ran that team through the draft. To a lot of people would say even to a fault. He very seldom made big trades. He very seldom brought free agents in. Um, he built through the draft, and he was going to continue on doing that, apparently, until it seems the ownership got a little impatient, and he went on his way. Um, now, I'm sure he learned from that, and maybe things will be a little different into going into Seattle, but he himself has come out and said, and I can't even find the quotes for this. Um, he is a lot like Lou Lamorello in the sense that he keeps things under wraps a lot. It's hard to get information from Ron, from Francis on what he's going to be doing. Uh, he doesn't talk to the media all that much. Uh, even when they hired uh, Hackstall, which we'll get into in a second, it came to a surprise to most because nobody really had a clue. Um, so I did, however through listening to Sirius Radio. They had several an analysts on there, and you can uh, uh, check out Sirius Radio. It's fantastic. Their NHL uh, programming is really, really good. They, all, they have pretty much anybody in, there is in hockey on there, and they have really good analysts. And several of them have said, through conversation with Ron Francis, that he has claimed that he's going to build from the goaltender out. Um, defense, goaltending, out. Now, this is really an old school way of uh, building a franchise for the most part. Analytics, now in the analytics world, the modern era, the sentiment is that you go grab all the scores you can, Build, yes, through the draft for the most part, and then add your goaltender later. Why? Because if you're going to be building from the bottom or going through a rebuild, um, you don't really need to win games. So having a strong goaltender actually works against you. Now, the old school way is that you build, you grab a goaltender, they're the most important part of the franchise and you build around the goaltending and the defense. Now, which way do I like on this one? I am actually lean to the old school way of building. Now, I'll tell you what. Part of rebuilding also, the most important part of rebuilding, is building systems into and, and getting an identity of your franchise through a system that has been put in place that you want all the players to understand and learn. That is very difficult to do if you have poor goaltending. As a person who played, building an offensive system or even a defensive system is very difficult to do if you think that every time you make a mistake, it's going to end up in the back of the net. When you become great, you are going to have good goaltending. Also, systems are built on the type of goaltender you have. Great coaches like Barry Trotz, Tortorella, and uh, Maurice, they build their systems around the strengths and weaknesses of their goaltenders. So it is a, 
to me, imperative that to get a goaltender right off the bat. Now, it doesn't have to be Carey Price or Marc-Andre Fleury or anyone such as that. Just somebody that's strong enough that you know that they can stop pucks enough that you can build a system where the players are confident that they can play that system and not have the have goals scored on them consistently. It's hard on the psyche. It's very difficult. It's just human nature that a player will play differently if they don't trust their goaltender. So, yes, I do think that building from goaltending out is a very solid way of doing it. Now, there is uh, something to be said about the modern age way of building a team where goal scoring is hard to find out there. Let's face it. people are Teams are looking for scoring all the time. And actually, what we are going to talk about is um, the New York Islanders, Tampa Bay Lightning, and the Philadelphia Flyers, and how Seattle, Fran Francis, may approach these teams when trying to build through the draft. Now, if you're going to build through the draft, what are you going to need? You're going to need draft picks, right? So, I believe Ron Francis is going to use the leverage that he has to build around the draft. I've got letters and letters and letters about how, I love your letters, by the way, send them. Guido goes down there to the letter room and he comes back every day, the sack of letters, and he pours them all over the letter table. We all do a little Perlo dance. Everybody, Helen, who stitches up your Pearls of Wisdom necklace. Hernandez and Melissa, it's fun, so send them. But, um, okay, well, first we're going to look at the New York Islanders. The New York Islanders are a team that has been built around depth. They spend a lot of money on their depth players. Um, They trade for depth players and give them healthy salaries, such as, say, Pajot, when they picked up from the Ottawa Senators, um, paying him $5 million a year. They've had, they have fourth line guys like Clutterbuck and Sezikis and Martin who make three to three and a half million dollars a year. A lot of people consider them the best fourth line in the league. Now, the, this has been very effective for them in making the semifinals on a regular basis uh, in the playoffs and making the playoffs to a certain extent. They're built for the playoffs. They kind of hope they make the playoffs and then they're built for the playoffs. It appears now after making the semifinals and losing to Tampa twice in a row, though, that it's become quite obvious that they're going to need some scoring in their lineup. They need a, 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 at least one winger to play with Barzal. They have guys like Lee and Eberle that are effective players, but they're not what you call a shoot-first player, high-scoring player. So, and... Most people that I talk to in the Facebook groups and all of that realize this. And what they're saying is the way the way the Islanders are going to solve this is they're going to put a player such as Everlay out to exp- exposed to expansion or Bailey. And then there's thoughts of Letty as well. everlay has got $5.5 million left on his contract for three more years. Bailey only has one more year. The thing about Bailey, though, is he has been a lifer in um, on the island. He's a, a guy like Lamorello does not like to disrespect guys like Bailey, who is stuck with the process all the way through and made it as far as he has. I have a feeling that they're going to end up protecting Bailey. Um, they'll also protect guys like Bellows and so on and so forth like that. Yes, Letty may be out there for on defense for um, Seattle to choose. Now, the thought is, Everlay is a good player. Uh, Seattle for sure will take Everlay. Now, if I'm Ron Francis, I'm looking at this and going, well, why would you expose Everlay if you really want him? This is a cap world right now. The leverage that... Um, Ron Francis has is that he has all the cap space in the world and he doesn't need to win next year. So he can go into these negotiations for which player they're going to select and say, you know what? I don't need Everly. 
why would I take Eberle off your hands? If you want me to take Eberle, you're going to have to juice it up a little bit. A second round pick, maybe Kiefer Bellows, maybe even higher than that. Um, I'm not going to take him for free. And now the New York Islanders, Lamorello can say, fine, just take whoever you want. And there's several players that they could take like uh, that, you know, like maybe somebody like Martin or which is a far lesser player. And he can kind of go, we'll just keep on going from there. Now, Ron Francis is banking that he didn't put Everly out there unless you had a player in mind that you wanted to replace him with. You need cap space. I know you need scoring up there. I think it, I'm going to I'm going to bet I'm going to gamble that it's worth it to you to remove Eberle. The option that Lamorello has is that after the expansion draft is over, he can put Eberle out there and see if anybody else would be willing to take him for nothing. That's the risk. But Francis will take that risk, I believe. And I also believe that Lamorello will be calling him before the pick is made and say, okay, we'll, we'll give you a second. He's gonna, they'll work the phones. They'll find the player that they're looking for, who that player may be. Maybe it's a Lion A from the Columbus Blue Jackets, say. Pure shooter, high score, probably would be, um, could be very effective beside a guy like a uh, possible 40 goal scorer, something that they don't have in their, their lineup. Just an example, may not be the guy. Do they want to take a chance that another team may take him? May, may want Eberle? In the cap world, $5.5 million for Eberle, who is basically a 40 to 50 point player and really has been kind of inconsistent in the playoffs, might be hard for some other team to chew on out there. So I have a feeling that that's that Lamorello will bite and give them a pick like that. Tell me what you think there in the comment section. The other team is the Philadelphia Flyers. Um, I could show you the whole lineup and everything, but basically the talk is that they're going to leave players like Van Beesbrook and Voracek out. Now the Philadelphia Flyers desperately need a defenseman to play alongside Provorov. After Niskanen left, it became increasingly obvious that that was a severe weakness to their roster. That player is going to, by the way, the, another reason why the Islanders can't do this and Philadelphia Flyers can't do this is they don't have the cap space to do these things, obviously. So the idea is, and I, I'm a Philadelphia Flyers fan in the East. It's my favorite team in the East. And so I talked to a lot of Philadelphia Flyers uh, fans, uh, especially being part of the Steel Flyers All Sports Network, uh, a network that started out as a Flyers network but is moving into everything and pays my bills. I talked to them a lot. People think, well, we're going to throw Van Beesbrook out there at $7 million for the next two years. And uh, that Seattle, you know, he, he had a good year in the second half last year. Seattle's going to need scoring. They need to hit the cap floor. That's the other one. And uh, they'll just pick them up. Well, there's a couple problems with that. Again, just as I said before, Seattle doesn't need a 30-some-odd-year-old player. And Everly is the same, about the same age. They don't need a, a player like that. They can find him a player like that somewhere else if they want. They're not going to do you a favor and give you cap space for nothing. It's not likely. So what they'll do is the same thing. Say, yeah, we'll take Van Riemsdyk off you, but it's going to cost you a second. Say Borachek's at $8 million. Now, it's only for this year, but if you want a guy like Jones or somebody and you want him now, you need that $8 million off the books. Francis is going to say, I know you need that $8 million off the books. They may even cost you a first next year. If I'm Ron Francis, that's the hardball I'm playing. I don't need it. So... If you don't want to do that, I'll take uh, I'll take one of your other players off your roster and uh, go from there. And he'll wait on the phone as they try to scramble to see if they can free up cap space some other way. If they can't, and they likely can't, especially for one of those two players, they'll be calling him back again and saying, okay, let's work out a deal. That's how I think he's going to pick up those players. So yes, if you want to get 
remove Van Riemsdyk or uh, uh, Van Riemsdyk or Voracek, it's possible, but not likely for uh, nothing. They're not going to just take it for nothing. I doubt it very much. Another one is Gosh to Spear. Now that's a possibility. You could leave Gosh to Spear out there. He may be too enticing to not take. He had a really good year last year. It would all depend. Hackstall was the coach for the Philadelphia Flyers. And while Hackstall was coaching for the Philadelphia Flyers, Gosh to Spear played some of his better hockey. So that is one at $4 million that they might bite on. Um, and maybe that's good enough. But if you're looking to get rid of guys like Van Riemsdyk and Voracek, it's probably going to cost you. Next one is the Tampa Bay Lightning. And we have the same concept of the Tampa Bay Lightning, as we know, are way over cap. Uh, it's been talked about for a long time. In fact, they're probably going to be changing the rules that a team has to play under the cap in the playoffs now because of the situation that happened with Kucherov uh, being hurt all year long, being injected into the roster when the playoffs started, putting them $10 million over the cap and giving them a pretty big edge over the other teams and doing that. So now they're not going to have that same possibility for next year, likely, especially. They're not going to be able to find a guy to go on the injured reserve all year and then just pop in in the playoffs. So their leverage is difficult. A guy that they were trying to, uh, before Kucherov said what he, that he was going to go for surgery, a guy they were trying to remove last year was Tyler Johnson. Tyler Johnson has a no movement clause, but decided to waive it being a nice guy that he is. And he is a very nice guy from what I understand. He's fantastic. Um, and they couldn't find any takers. Now, does that mean that there were teams out there saying, hey, you know what? Give me a package that makes sense and I'll take them off your hands. And maybe they would have done something like that had Kucherov not been there. Now, in this situation, Seattle will take the phone call and Ron Francis will be saying, I don't need Johnson. I don't need really anybody. So I know you're in cap hell right now. If you want me to take any of your cap high players, it's going to cost you. Unless you give me a really, really good one like Sorelli or something like that. I can't see that happening. Um, it's going to cost you a lot. Now, Tampa Bay can turn around and say, forget it. I don't want that package. I'll wait till after the expansion draft and try again to go to another team such as Detroit or, uh, or Arizona that may have that have the cap space and work out a deal with them for Johnson, or they can not take that risk and remove them right away. Because if they don't, now they have to protect them, and the uh, or actually they don't have to protect them. But if they don't, Tampa or uh, Seattle gets to pick another player off their roster, anyways, which can be fairly significant for them. They have a lot of good players that are going to be available, like Joseph, and um, that Seattle would be very happy with. So the cost to remove a guy like Johnson could be very expensive. Could be Joseph, a first next year, all of those things. That's what I would be looking at and asking for if I'm Ron Francis. I'm playing hardball with everybody um, with my cap space because it's the greatest leverage that I have. And as far as getting to the cap floor, they'll say, well, they got to get to the cap floor. They do, but there's plenty of free agents there out there they can sign. In after the after the expansion draft, they can go to players that obviously have players that they want to get rid of, take draft picks, and reach the cap floor. Say Calgary Flames, for instance. Call up the Calgary Flames and say, hey. Give me a second round pick and we'll take Lucic off your hands for a while so we can reach the cap floor. Um, Erickson in Vancouver, there's lots of players out there that have that, lots of bad contracts that they can pick up to get to the cap floor and get more picks. So if you're going to Seattle and you're wanting to get rid of your scrap or bad contracts, expect to pay and pay dearly. Tell me if you think this is true 
if uh, what I'm saying is accurate, or maybe you've got a different lean on it. I love to hear what you got to say. Until next time, have a great day. That's my full 42. Okay, bye.